Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I am coming to you with another reading vlog. This time though, we have a theme. I know, who am I? I never do a themed reading vlog. But this week, I really wanted to do the experiment that a lot of booktubers have been doing where you replace your screen time for reading time. And I personally am very scared at what I'm going to find in my screen time section on my iPad. But before we get into that, I wanted to tell you that I am once again working with Ana Luisa Jewelry. And I'm really excited about that because I really love their jewelry and partnering with them has been such a joy this year. Of course, they have a sale ongoing right now because can you believe it? We're literally, at the time of filming this, we are literally two weeks away from Black Friday. And when you see this, I think it will be within a week very scary. <laughs> the second half of the year has completely flown by. So they do have a sale currently, but I also have a code for you that I will leave in the description down below. They did send me three pieces this time and I wanted to share them to you. So the first are these earrings. They're very small. So I took a close up of them on the package because they're really cute. The pendant feels very bookish to me. I don't know if that's what it's intended to be, but it felt very bookish to me when I looked at it. And I really like layering earrings since I have two holes. And so I've been wanting some that were smaller to wear with larger hoops. And I think these will add some interest when I'm wearing like a larger hoop earring because I also have a pair of hoop earrings from Ana Luisa that I love. And I think they will look really cute together. I also got this necklace. This is the Hannah necklace. And so it was designed, I think, actually by Hannah from A Clockwork Reader, who is such a big booktuber, and I'm sure all of you watch her if you're watching me. And I have watched her videos for so long, and this necklace is so eye-catching every time she wears it. And so I just really love how eye-catching it is and how subtle the design is. You can see the design from far away, I think, but it's more rewarding when you're looking at it up close and you can see all of the detail. Uh, and so this is a piece that I really love. And last but not least, I got this thumb ring, which is called the Stephanie. So it's kind of a small band and I really like it because the metal is so dainty. It's not a really thick ring, which is often what I've had in thumb rings before. And so I knew when I saw how small that was, I wanted to size it so that it would be a thumb ring for me. And I'm really happy with that. I think it's really cute. And it goes so well, you know, with their other rings and jewelry. I really love Ana Luisa as a company because they are 100% carbon neutral and they are making a big effort to reduce their carbon footprint. And that that's one of the biggest things to me about them. That's why I really love them. But I also just really appreciate the design and quality of their jewelry. Their jewelry very much fits my vibe. And so uh, I will leave a link for you down in the description below to check them out. And thank you to Ana Luisa for continuing to work with me. But let's look at my stats, okay? I'm scared. Uh, I'm not, I'm not worried because I don't actually think I spend as much time on my phone as most people do. I'm not really big on my phone. What will get me is my iPad. And so that's the one we're going to look at the stats for. That's the one that we need to be concerned about. I did look at my phone, but since I do all of my filming and editing on my phone, the large majority of screen time on there is in my camera app because I'm filming like I am right now, and then also in iMovie where I edit my videos. So I didn't really think I could take the screen time per day as seriously as I'm going to be able to on my iPad. <laughs> and my iPad is where I spend all my recreational time, basically. Ever since I got an iPad, my phone has kind of fallen by the wayside. And when I first started my channel, I actually filmed and edited on my iPad. And so it was a big jump for me to move to my phone for that. I really am not a big phone person. And so my stats on my phone were not that bad. It was maybe an hour a day. And a lot of that spent entirely in camera or in my iMovie app. So that didn't shock me. Uh, but my iPad is what I switch to. And it's where I do most everything else. And I do a lot on my iPad because I also don't 
get home from work and want to sit on a desktop computer. So everything is done for me recreationally, basically, on my iPad. And so that means like crafting stuff. Like I design my little K-pop Polaroids. I watch YouTube. That's the one I'm worried about. Because over the past week, I have spent an incredible amount of time on YouTube. What am I watching on YouTube? It's not really educational content that I'm watching. It's also basically not even booktube. Last week, I found myself wondering, I was like, does anybody even make booktube videos anymore? Where is so-and-so? And like, when I look up people's individual names, oh yeah, they've been making videos consistently for months. YouTube has just learned what to recommend to me. And it is both my shame and my happy place, okay? It's all K-pop music videos all the time. It is what it is. And so that's the app that I'm scared to see the most of, but I'm gonna take the average of the day. So whether I spent that in PixArt, like editing the Polaroids, whether I spent it in YouTube, watching music videos, whether I spent it on TikTok, which is also for me, sadly enough, a K-pop black hole. So I am just going to take the average of the day for last week because I know I spent a lot of time on my iPad last week and a lot of reading didn't get done. I still don't think it's going to be that bad. And I don't really know that I'm going to be able to commit to the hour amount that I have per day for each day this week. I don't know that that's doable, but somehow it was doable for me to watch YouTube videos for three hours last Monday. Yeah, it, it somehow was. Uh, so I am looking... I am looking right now. Let's just do Monday to Friday because the weekends, we don't need to know. I don't think we need to know that. So Monday, October 31st, which was Halloween, three hours and 23 minutes. An hour and 15 minutes of that was YouTube. Less than what I thought. The other hour was spent on TikTok. 30 minutes spent on Spotify. And then we have like variously like Pinterest, Pixar, the whole shebang. I don't really feel like that's bad. This is not a judgment zone. If you're on your phone or your iPad more or less than this, uh, it's not a race and I'm not really trying to compare myself to anybody, but I don't actually think this is that bad. I know it is more than it was in the past though. Tuesday, three hours and 12 minutes. Um, so again, TikTok. Again, YouTube, an hour each on each of those platforms. So basically, that's what we've got to eliminate. We've got to eliminate <laughs> YouTube and TikTok here. Uh, Wednesday, three hours and 15 minutes. What do you think? TikTok and YouTube. I'm actually shocked that TikTok has more than YouTube. Shocking. Thursday, Oh my gosh, Thursday, four hours and 41 minutes, four hours and 41 minutes. And all of this is at night. It is telling me actually like on a bar graph throughout the day, like the times of the day that you use it most. And that's true. Historically, I used to use reading quite a bit as like my way to come down from the day and it was maybe the last thing that I did every night before I went to sleep and that's no longer the truth like now before I go to sleep it's it's YouTube time it's music time so that doesn't shock me this again two hours on YouTube basically two hours on TikTok oh my gosh what was happening to me on Thursday uh, and then Friday, right at three hours. Again, TikTok and YouTube and Pixar and all of that. So I don't truly feel as though that's bad. Again, I feel like I'm not really going to be able to commit to three hours per day every day this week. That's just not doable for me. Um, but I do feel like over the past couple of weeks, I've had more downtime and I've had more time to read. I just have been using that time to be on YouTube and TikTok apparently. So uh, we will change that this week. Maybe what I'll say is that this week when I have the impulse to watch my YouTube videos for an hour, that I will take that time 
and then I will read. And I think when I see these stats of like an hour on each platform, it literally is an hour at a time. I'm not somebody who just flicks in and out, like just picks up my iPad or picks up my phone and looks at something for a minute and sits it down. I really go all in. Like when I get on TikTok, I do spend some time there. So I think that might make this a more manageable challenge because I will really allot that time to reading, but I don't know that I'll actually be able to make it to three hours per day reading, but we'll try. So do I have a TBR for this? Not really. Uh, I decided to do this now because I'm actually between books and I think it's going to be good to possibly put in something that's a little bit longer, something that I really want to tackle and that I want to get off my TBR, but also include some newer things that I'm really excited about or something shorter. And so I'm not quite sure right now what I will pick up first, but today is Monday and I think we've got to get started on it now. So I think I'll try and time myself. We'll see how it goes. It is Tuesday, so it is day two of the challenge of replacing screen time with reading time. Uh, I may sound different because I just had to have an orthodontist appointment today, so I'm not happy. But I want to say, did Monday get off to the best start? Was I successful? No. Uh, I think I wound up getting in maybe a good hour, hour and a half of reading time. I'm sorry too about my tripod as it looks literally like things are on a slant right now and I have no earthly idea why that is happening so I hope this is not actually crooked. But anyways, I think my thing with this challenge is that I'm going to be very forgiving because I don't always have the same amount of free time every evening. I don't always have the same amount of free time every day. So the ability to spend three hours doing anything I'm enjoying, whether that's reading or being on TikTok or YouTube or anything like that, that is flexible for me day to day. And it's certainly flexible week to week, dependent upon what I have going on. And Last night, the Holiday Baking Championship came on Food Network, so like I had something going on. It was two hours. I had to watch it. You can argue that during that time I could have been doing some reading, but uh, I wound up making Christmas K-pop Polaroids instead. So I wound up actually probably spending about the same amount of time Monday of this week as I did Monday of last week on like pics art and Pinterest and stuff like that, looking for pictures. So that's just though an easier thing for me to do and an easier hobby for me to have, like when I'm watching something, to just have something going that's mindless, not something like reading that I have to focus on. But I did start two books. I don't know if they are the best books to be reading for this challenge, but Hey. The first of these is The Last Letters of Jacopo Ortiz by Ugo Foscolo because I just recently picked this up when I went to Italy and I was really excited about this one and this is a book that's been on my radar for some time because it is a romantic classic and I'm really into romanticism. This is very reminiscent in some ways of The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe and I kind of worry about it because of that. I wonder about where the book is going to go in terms of plot. But one thing that's been, I think, nice about this challenge and that I think is going to be nice about replacing screen time with reading time is that it means that when I am reading, I am allowing myself to take the time to annotate and I don't always allow myself to do that. So for example, you can see that I have written all over this page. So I've been doing that and I find it very engaging actually and it really elevates the reading experience for me when I am annotating something. And this one is kind of an easy book to annotate in my opinion. I can kind of tell kind of the themes that he is going for and I really am enjoying that part of it. But I don't really know that a classic like this, a classic that's a little bit densely written and is clearly something that I'm interested in annotating, is it the ideal for a project like this? Maybe it is because in the end, I'm not doing this so that I push through more books. I'm actually very happy with the amount of books that I read per month. But 
I wanted to do this to maybe make myself want to pick up books that I have been putting off maybe because of their size, because I know it's going to take me a really long time to read. But this one is one that I'm just really excited about. I probably should have saved this for Feb Regency next year, but it is what it is. So we will see how much further I get in this. This might be a book that I decide to take pretty slowly. So maybe I'll fold something else in. This is the mistake right here. I can tell you that this is the mistake. This is Foul Lady Fortune by Chloe Gong. And I, starting last week, I really wanted to evaluate my book of the month shelves. And I think maybe I'll do a video all about that where I look over stuff that I have picked up from book of the month that I, for some odd reason, have yet to pick up. And I'm guilty of doing this a lot with book of the month. I'm really excited about something. And then when it comes out and people start to uh, leave their negative reviews of it, my interest in it wanes just a little bit. And I feel like this is particularly true for me with book of the month books. It's not just always true of new releases, but I feel like book of the month really is very hit or miss for me. But when they hit, they hit really, really high. So These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong, which was a Romeo and Juliet retelling, was a pick for Book of the Month two years ago. And I was really enthralled in that. I thought it was fantastic. I loved the way that she wrote. To my knowledge, they never put the second book in that duology on Book of the Month. And so uh, when I picked this up, I realized that I had never finished that duology. And though this is a separate series, it very clearly continues on from what was happening in these violent delights and these violent ends. So these violent delights was a Romeo and Juliet retelling set in 1920s Shanghai. And there was a supernatural element to it, which I really enjoyed. I personally love historical fantasy. That's just one of the things that I really love. And it was very reminiscent to me of The Diviners by Libba Bray. Like she just has the gift of allowing you to feel like you really are in the setting with the characters. And I just thoroughly enjoyed that. When I started this last night, I realized that I never finished the duology. And I mean, really in the end, what is there to spoil? Because Romeo and Juliet we kind of know how that ends. And that's what this talked about. But the main character of this was a prominent side character in the earlier series. And so I feel as though I am missing pertinent information from her backstory. So I'm kind of curious now if I should put this down and actually read the other book in the series. And I feel like at this point I should reread These Violent Delights. So this may not be the best one to be reading, but I picked this up because it is so big. And I really thought that I would let it linger on my shelves a little bit if I didn't go on and pick it up. But I really find this intriguing. There's a lot about this that I think is semi-confusing because I'm not at all familiar with the historical landscape of 1920s, 1930s Shanghai. And that's one of the more interesting aspects of this kind of overarching series or this series that's connected. I think that's really fascinating. And so part of me just really enjoys the historical fiction aspect, but part of me also really is interested in how she handles kind of the fantastical elements. So I don't know, this one feels pretty iffy to me. I feel like both of the books that I've decided to start with are maybe not the ideal for this project. So yesterday I got in maybe an hour, an hour and a half of reading. I didn't track that because I didn't really wanna feel the pressure of it. I feel like if I put a timer on something, then I'm really going to feel pressured to do it. And so I kind of just looked at the time and I got in maybe an hour yesterday. So nowhere near the three hours that I spent last Monday in terms of screen time. And today I also have to hit around three hours. So let's see how that goes. I will check in with you later. I will let you know if I decide to swap in anything else. Okay, it's Wednesday. And after today, we will be halfway through the challenge of replacing screen time with reading time. Monday, absolutely was not a success. Supposed to reach three hours, got maybe one hour, but that's okay. Because yesterday, Tuesday, I did manage three hours and I finished one of my books. I did decide to put Foul Lady Fortune aside for the time being because I really felt like I was missing pertinent information. I really felt like 
I needed to read these violent ends to even have a context for what was going on in that. So I feel like I need to read these violent ends and then I'll be prepared to go into that one. So I'm kind of free to move into another book now because I did finish uh, the last letters of Jacopo Ortiz. This was really short. That's kind of why I wanted to throw this in here and I wanted to go on and read it while I was feeling very strongly about it, while I really wanted to pick it up. This is a romantic classic from the early 1800s in Italy and I feel like that should have clued me in maybe to what the subject matter is because all I knew was that this is kind of about uh, Italy after Napoleon's occupation. And specifically, it follows a main character who was a little bit like Ugo Foscolo, the author, who is from the Veneto in the Venice region of Italy, which after Napoleon was kind of given over to the Austrians, which felt like a massive betrayal to uh, the people of Venice and just the people of the Veneto. And in general, the Italian peninsula was just in a state of like, absolute chaos after Napoleon came through. And so half of this book is like, I hate Napoleon. And that's valid. And I think those parts were really interesting. And I'm glad that I did my year of Napoleon last year. So I had a lot of context for what was going on in this book politically and historically, because really the book is not giving you anything detail wise. It kind of assumes you already know this stuff. And so luckily I had context for what was going on. The other side of it is kind of him falling in love with his muse, his Beatrice or his Laura, and she is engaged to marry somebody else. And I am a sucker for a good you know, a good guy and his muse story. Like it, it will always get me. There's something about that trope that I really like because I think we utilize muses in the modern day in really interesting ways. I mean, every week I do something in my K-pop journal about one of my muses. And I think it's really interesting because the muse is typically somebody you have no personal relationship with. They're just somebody who inspires you creatively, who makes you want to create art. And that's kind of what Laura was for Petrarch. That's kind of what Beatrice was for Dante. Uh, and in the modern day, you can see this a lot with uh, fashion in particular. And so you can see that fashion designers will design a piece with a certain person in mind and maybe they never wear it but they use Marilyn Monroe or somebody as a muse and so I think the concept of the muse is interesting in this book it's different because he does know this girl and conceivably he wants to be with her and she's engaged to marry this man who's kind of like let's just say a bore like he's not really into art he's not really into history he's not somebody that you're gonna have a great philosophical debate with and i felt really sorry for that dude actually but this is told in epistolary style and we're just getting uh the letters from jacopo ortiz and occasionally the guy who he was writing to, Lorenzo, will pop in and say, hey, I don't have the whole letter here. I only have this fragment. And I really enjoy an epistolary novel. I think I would have enjoyed this more had we gotten Lorenzo's side of things. Like if we had known how Lorenzo responded to some of these things. I, I have mixed opinions about this because some of the most beautiful language I have ever read in my life was in this book. Like, my favorite part of this book happens early on and they go to visit Petrarch's house. And he says, we continued on our brief pilgrimage until we saw, white in the distance, the little house which at one time welcomed that man whose fame the world cannot contain, whose Laura had on earth celestial honors. I approached the house like one about to prostrate himself on the tombs of his ancestors, or like one of those priests who used to frequent in silent reverence the woods inhabited by the gods. Owing to the impiety of the owners of this treasure, the sacred home of that sublime Italian is falling down. In vain will travelers come from distant lands and look with pious wonder for the room still echoing with the heavenly poems of Petrarch. Instead, they will weep over a heap of ruins covered with nettles and weeds in which the solitary fox has made its lair. 
Oh, Italy, appease the shades of your great men. I mean, <laughs> it really, it really is so great. Like, he even says, I could describe this girl to you, to Lorenzo, who he loves. But he says, what is the use of making an imperfect copy of an imitable picture when its fame alone gives a better idea of it than the wretched copy does? And does it not seem to you that I am like those poets who translate Homer? because you see me tiring myself out only in order to water down the feeling which inflames me and dissolve it in my feeble phraseology. Night followed by the shadows and the stars seemed to be in flight before the sun, which was issuing in great splendor from the eastern clouds like the lord of the universe, and the universe was smiling. The clouds, gilded and tinged with a thousand colors, were climbing up the clear vault of heaven, which looked almost as if it were revealing itself for the purpose of shedding upon mortal beings the Godhead's loving care. I mean, it's dreamy and it's beautiful, and there's a passage in here where he goes to Santa Croce in Florence that was amazing. Uh, so the language of this is definitely a five star. I'm a sucker for Napoleon in Italy. So I really enjoyed the political background here. But this book is like so many others of the Romantic period in that it is very clearly inspired by The Sorrows of Young Brother by Goethe. When I say that, I think you know where this book is going and you know it's going in a very heavy, harsh direction. And I did not handle The Sorrows of Young Brother very well. That was a very dark book for me. And that's the way this one felt, at least when I read Werther. I actually had no context for it and I did not know where the book was going. And so I thought, oh, maybe we're gonna get out of this as the book kind of barreled downhill toward the event. I thought, well, we can get out of this. You know, things can change. But because I had read Werther reading this, I knew that this was inevitable. Like, this book felt inevitable to me in a way that Werther did not. But what was so sad about this is that Jacopo met so many different people in his travels around Italy who were clearly down on their luck, but were powering through. And I thought, oh, maybe we're gonna take these examples of people getting through hardship and we're going to do something positive here and we're going to use that as an example. I don't want to spoil it for you, but I feel like if you've read Werther, this goes great in conversation with it. I did like this a whole lot more than Werther. Werther started out sad and depressing and kept that tone. For the most part, this was just one that started out actually pretty light and entertaining and you knew that the tone was going to shift because you knew that the character was not going to get what he wanted. And I think having the political side of things impacting him as well, not just a personal relationship with this muse-like character who basically had no features whatsoever other than that she was kind of his muse and she, he was into her. But I think the political component of like losing your homeland or your homeland losing its identity, I think that made this more hard hitting for me and really actually sadder than Werther. And so on the whole, my mood went down because I read this and I feel like I'm only going to give it four stars because of that. It's not a favorite book. I really don't know when I would reread it because the tone was so sad and depressing, but I, I'm glad I read it because I think the language was so stunningly beautiful. So, I mean, there's good and bad and everything, but this was really romantic, romantic with a capital R. And the scene where they went to Petrarch's house was everything to me. So, I don't know. I would love to read more by Ugo Fosclo. Like, specifically, I would love to read Sepulchres, which is his really long-form poem, I think, about Santa Croce in Florence. And so I would love to read that, and I feel like I would like his poetry. So, I mean, in many ways, I enjoyed this, and I think it was great to read it in a three-hour chunk of time because it meant that I really powered through. And I also got to annotate along the way. The book's only about 150 pages, but I really took that three hours to sit and digest the book. So I enjoyed that part of it, but I mean, 
it was very, very sad. Uh, and it made me emotional at the end. I struggle with characters that are uh, dealing with depression, let's say, that are dealing with very, very heavy depression and intrusive thoughts like this character was, and that's very hard for me to read. Uh, and this was no exception to that. So uh, if you wanna read this, I would look up some trigger warnings and the trigger warnings are going to spoil the whole entire book for you. But I still think it's better to go into this knowing what you're getting into. Because again, I really didn't, I just was starting to read this and I said, oh dear, this feels a little bit like the sorrows of young Werther. Then as it got further into it, I said, oh, oh gosh, this is, this is a lot like the Sorrows of Young Werther. And it really was. So if you loved Werther, read this. But I really liked this and I liked it more than Werther. I don't think I had the best translation of Werther. But uh, I'm excited to move on from this and to move on from Foul Lady Fortune. I'm going to pick something else up, maybe something a little bit lighter. But you know what? I see Thomas Mann like sitting over on my shelf. It's a thought, you know, it's a thought. I have a couple of things too by Herman Hesse that I would like to read. So maybe I should kind of keep up this momentum and go with a book that I know I would annotate and allow myself to take the time to do it. Hello, it's finally time to update you. I'm coming to you with natural hair uh, and just like cozy because I've told myself, why do I feel like I need to be completely put together for a vlog? Vlogs are supposed to be casual and I enjoy vlogs more when I feel like people are not rehearsed. So you're just gonna sadly have to deal with me looking like this because I realized that I thought uh, that I had gone on and updated you for the past two days, but apparently I either never hit record or just something has happened to that footage. But knowing me, I just sat here and spoke into the wind and I never hit the record button. But that's okay. Today is the last day of the challenge. And I have to say, on the whole, I feel as though this has not been a success and it has not been all that enjoyable. I actually have read for the set amount of time. So I've done exactly what I wanted to do in terms of reading a set amount every day. I personally just think it's too much to read every day. Uh, and right now I'm feeling like I don't want to complete the challenge, which is sad to say. And I'm so glad that I didn't say I really wanted to do this for a seven day week because that just is not realistic. But I can see why the majority of my time on my iPad is spent on things like TikTok and YouTube because that's a key part of my bookish process. Like a key part of me being inspired to read is looking at what other people are reading. And I think not having that component there this week has meant that I've not been nearly as inspired to pick up a book even though I'm excited about it. I started out the week very excited to read and very excited about this idea and now I feel as though I have spent far too much time in it. So I don't know that I'm going to be able to call this a success but the last time that I spoke to you I believe it was the second or third day, and I had actually finished something, The Last Letters of Jacopo Ortiz, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I would say was a success. Wednesday night, Wednesday in particular, I think has been my most successful day of the week, because I did reading sprints with Christy Lewis over on her channel, and that really meant that I reached the finish line in terms of my reading goals for the day. The mistake there is that I started reading a book that I was really pumped about and that I was really excited about and has unfortunately really let me down. I'm going to be honest about it. And that's Devils. Sometimes it's called Demons by Dostoevsky. I am almost halfway through this beast. I have been partially listening to it. I have been partially reading it. Mostly I have been listening to it while reading it on the page, which is something that I enjoy doing with classics and I thought would really help me here. I just have not enjoyed this at all. I found it a slog when I was doing the reading sprints and so I do think that should have been a clue to me that maybe I either wasn't in the mood for it 
or it's just not for me. And I think it's just not for me. And it's a shame. This is the book that I was the most excited about of Dostoyevsky's, other than uh, The Brothers Karamazov, which I'm kind of saving to the last. I was really pumped about this, and this is the first book of his, and actually just the first piece of any of his writing that I have not enjoyed. There is a tone to this that I distinctly do not like. It's almost gotten to the point where I am about to go spoil myself. I want to see what this book is going to become. I want to know how this is going to end because I really at this point don't see the point in it. There are shades of greatness in it and there are moments when I really see the Dostoevsky that I love coming through. But this is so just, I mean, it's just a slog, frankly. And the tone of it, I feel like he wants you to think this book is at least partially funny. It's not playing very well for me in terms of its humor, and it is a book, I will tell you, I feel is far too long. Uh, but I also think my enjoyment has been impaired by the audiobook narrator. I had to get the audiobook narrator that wasn't as positively reviewed <laughs> because uh, they were actually narrating this translation, the translation that I had, and so that's really what I wanted. And I think the audiobook narrator is so robotic that anything that could be enjoyable about it, like they have sucked out of the book. They've really sucked the life out of the story. And so I like on one hand and bored, on the other hand, I just think tonally it is all over the place. And I think too, you might say reading three hours a day, which was the average and is what I am supposed to be doing every day this week. I think three hours a day, I should be over halfway through this. I really do. But today I have actually put off reading because I know I have to read this book. I have put off reading because I am absolutely not interested in this. And I'm just going to DNF it. I don't necessarily have a hard time with this, but I know other people who do. I know people who are scared to say they didn't enjoy a classic or that they don't like a certain classic author. I don't care. Not every book is for every person. This book is 100% not for me. And it's a shame because Dostoevsky was one of my favorite discoveries of last year. And I felt like for sure this was a shoe in for me. This was going to be an easy five stars. And I wanted to tackle a really big book this week when I was replacing screen time with reading time because I thought it could prove to me that maybe I can really move through a longer book if I allot certain time to it. But I also have to say, I think on the whole, this project is a complete failure because I have not taken into account just how much social media does directly impact me in a positive way in terms of my relationship to reading. It gets me hyped up. I love to hear when a lot of different people are talking about the same book and it really gets me excited and it gets me interested in it. And I feel like not having that this week has made me feel like I'm really insular and I don't necessarily like that. Even though I know I said at the start of this video that I've not been watching a lot of booktube content, but apparently I've been watching more than what I thought. I actually feel like this had the reverse effect on me and I do feel as though it's honestly about to push me into a slump. And so today is the last day and I'm feeling like I'm probably not going to stress about it at all and we'll get done what we get done. Three hours per day, technically yesterday, Thursday, I should have done four hours, but that would have been a feat in and of itself just to have four hours of free time honestly. So I, I'm i not going to sweat that. Three hours per day is basically what I decided on at the start of the week, and I think that's what's doable, so we'll see. We're back in the same location, in the same outfit, with the same hair, and today is over. It's getting really dark outside, and I don't feel as though I'm going to get any more reading done because Warrior Nun Season 2 came out, and I feel like I need to be watching that. So was today successful? after having a not so successful Wednesday and Thursday. 
I think actually that's the wrong word to use successful because in truth, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. I read for those hours each day. Whether I enjoyed the book, that was up for debate and I really was not enjoying Devils. So I've DNF'd that for the time being. But today I decided to go with an author that has often helped me get out of a slump before and I really feel like this was putting me into one. So I decided to pick up an Agatha Christie and I picked up The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. And I feel like in the three hour time span, I maybe should have finished this, but I am about 75% of the way through. And I really like Agatha Christie to help me get out of um, a reading slump because she's so quick moving and because her books are relatively short. So I have heard mixed things about the ending of this one, but I'm engaged in this. I don't think it's going to be my favorite of hers. I don't think this will be my favorite of hers, but I am enjoying it. Though I think really, I do think within three hours, I probably should have finished this. Uh, just in terms of what my average reading speed is, I do feel like this is a book I probably should have finished in that time span, but what do I know? So I feel like we're going to finish out fairly strongly. I am so sorry that this vlog did not turn out the way that I intended it to. I wanted this to be a really positive experience where I really got involved in reading, but this just goes to show that I really cannot force myself to do anything. I really cannot. It sounds like a good idea to me, but the second that I put something on a TBR, the second that I say I have to read something, I'm no longer interested in it. And there's just something about me that's stubborn like that, that really has to go against the grain. And I feel like that's kind of been my feeling this whole week because I really did start this week off excited about this project and excited about reading more. And one of my goals about midway through the year was to read more each day and to actually read for a set period of time each day. And that has largely not happened here in the second half of the year. I think it shows that I can be successful. I can replace screen time with reading time but I think I must just not have chosen the best books for the project on the whole. So I am sorry to say that this feels as though this was kind of a failure, but I do also think it was a learning experience. I don't think I will ever put this kind of restriction on myself again, unless I really have a good TBR in mind, unless I have a set set of books that I know I am excited about and that I know are going to work well for me. Sadly, this seemed like a group of shoe in books for me because a lot of them were by authors that I had read before and enjoyed. Uh, if they weren't like The Last Letters of Jacopo Ortiz, it was from a time period that I tend to really enjoy. And so I just feel like on the whole, I felt okay about everything and Devils, frankly, I just did not like. So I DNF'd that and I think that was for the best. But everything else, I feel like I was just a little bit middle of the road towards. So sadly, I don't feel as though this was the best experiment, but I am encouraged by this because it does show me that I can give up screen time in order to read. And I think maybe in the end, going forward, that's just what I need to do. There needs to be a balance. I don't need to be just reading, but I also don't need to be just on my screen. I don't need to be just watching K-pop music videos for three hours every day. I don't need to do that. I don't. I thought about carrying on through the weekend here and seeing if I could find another shoe in, another great book, but I'm just not going to do that because we are almost heading into the week of Thanksgiving here in the United States, and I felt like I should do just a separate regular reading vlog for that. But uh, I would love to know down below if you have ever tried this, if you have ever replaced your screen time with reading time, if you ever track how much you read per day. Uh, I feel like that puts a level of pressure on it, and clearly I am somebody who doesn't do well with restrictions. 
Please remember to check out Anna Luisa. I will have their link in my description box down below with uh, a discount code for you. It's time to start thinking about gifts for friends and family, which is crazy to think about, or even something for yourself. So I will have their link in my description box down below, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.